I made Marta play a little extra there. Thank you for keeping a close eye on it, all the scurrying about before we begin. Uh, one announcement for you today. I uh, want to, uh, a little praise to share, a joy. We did have our men's, first men's gathering on Saturday, yesterday. Um, and uh, I know Gary and I, we've been, you know, the Nurture Commission's been talking quite a while about getting a men's group going and doing a study and, and you know, finding out what it was that the men would like to do. And uh, but I think, I, I speak for myself, I try to keep my expectations low, you know, and I thought, well, we'll get together and we'll talk about it a little bit. We'll kick some ideas around. We'll table it. We'll circle back around to it. We'll spend several months trying to figure it out what it is we, we want to do. And God said, no, they're ready to go. And so they, uh, the men were, were, you know, a, a good time of sharing, a good time of conversation, and uh, were ready to commit to starting a men's fellowship with study. Uh, it'll be the first and third Saturday of the month at 6.30 a.m. So don't come at 6.30 p.m. because you'll be all by yourself. Maybe there'll be another person that misread that too. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the benefit of that is that it allows uh, you to have your day yeah, and also kind of gets you going and lets you have that space to spend time with your family as well on that weekend. And I understand it's not perfect for everybody, so stay tuned if you look at that and go, whew, 6.30 may not work for me. We'll just keep checking back, keep an eye on it, and we'll, we'll see what we can do uh, down the way. But I was just so, so blessed that... The, the men of the congregation that were able to be there for that gathered together, had a vision, shared that vision with each other, moved forward with it, made plans for it. So if you weren't here, then come. Come on the, the second will be the first one. Uh, they'll have a, a, a time together for that. Uh, and then uh, stick around for the car show that's going to be here, the benefit after that. So I just have to say how gratified I was. And in that let you know that it's coming up. 2nd of October will be the first one at 6.30 here at the church. Uh, we hope that uh, you can make time for that. So thank you, men, for that. I'm going to step aside. That is the only thing I wanted to share. Carol, could you begin our service today? Isn't it a beautiful morning? He's got clouds in the sky. We might see some rain. <laughs> Are we happy about that? I hope so. I haven't been here for a little while. I've been traveling all over this state of Idaho. Isn't it beautiful? It's a beautiful state. Three weeks ago, I was in Soda Springs. Last weekend, I was in Chalice. Next weekend, I will be in Kamii. And it is a beautiful, beautiful state that we live in. Thank you, God. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see what else we've got going today. Well, it says here on my program that today's scripture is Psalm 119 verses 129 to 136. Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem for me the impression, oppression of men that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes for your law is not obeyed. Let us pray. Dear Lord, show me your ways. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God, my Savior, and my hope 
is in you all day long. Amen. Okay, Peggy. Well, can we do another good morning? <laughs> it just feels like that's what you should say when you come up to the microphone, you know? Good morning. <laughs> Let's stand, and instead of saying good morning, let's sing to the Lord. We have come into his house to worship him. That's our purpose today. We have come into his house.
Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that by you all things are created, that you are in heaven and on earth. Guard our hearts, and may we, in bringing in our offerings to you now, store up treasure in our kingdom. In you, in your powerful name. Amen. Father God, you are the maker of heaven and earth. Accept the tithes and offerings we present to you today. Amen. Got a few kids that would like to come up. We'll, I'll talk to you. <laughs> Josh is sleepy today. That's all right. Yeah. <sighs> Are the ladies coming up? All right. Come on. So, in the back of our house, there's a flower bush that comes up. You guys know what peonies are? Nancy, would you like to sit down right here? You can sit down. Perfect. Okay, so do you guys know what peonies are, flowers? No? It's a type of flower, okay, that comes up in the spring. I'm not going to talk to you about peonies, though. I'm going to talk to you about what's behind the peonies at our house. There are yellow jackets or wasps or hornets. I don't know what they are, but they fly around sometimes. And there's not really very many of them. There's just a few. But last week, we had some plumbing problems in our house and I had to open up a section of wall in our basement to look inside there to, so that the, the plumbers could get to the pipes and you know what I saw back there in the back? Look at that. What do you think that is? It is a paper wasp nest. And it, on the outside of the house right behind here that's where that peony is and that's where those wasps would fly around and I thought oh my goodness that's where they're coming from can you see that you guys can't see that can you but I gotta tell you it's about that big all right and fortunately you don't have like a bajillion wasps in there they just keep building those nests and they get bigger and bigger and bigger now this made me think of something Sometimes in our lives, we have things that are hidden away. We do things maybe that we shouldn't do. And when we do things that we shouldn't do, and we hide them away from God, you know what happens? Sometimes they can get bigger and bigger and bigger. Just like this wasp nest. And I'm not bad on wasps. I think wasps are part of what God created, and they're kind of cool. But... It's a little scary to think that that thing was growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger down in the dark. No, I left it. But down in the dark underneath our house where nobody could see it. That's the way it is in our hearts sometimes too. We can keep things from God or we think we can. And when they grow bigger and bigger and bigger until they get to be a big problem. All right? That happens to everybody when we try to hide things from God. No, this is the house we're living in right now. So, this is what I want us to think about today. Make sure that you show everything to God. You can pray and you can say, God, 
you can shine a light like I did here in our crawl space. You can shine a light into all the different places in my life and see what's there. And if there's anything there that maybe shouldn't be there, you can pray that God will help you get rid of it. And in God's strength, you can do that. What are sand, what are sand wasps? I'm not sure. We'll have to look that up. So, don't let things grow in the dark. Make sure that you talk to God about them so that you, God can help you deal with those things, okay? That may be something that you'll have to deal with later as you get older, but it's a good thing to think about right now, all right? No, it's cool, but it is a little scary. Okay, let's pray. Lord, sometimes we let things grow in the dark in our lives, things that we're kind of ashamed of or embarrassed or we don't really want you to know about, but you know about those things even if we don't tell you. You know that they're there. We pray that we would let you shine your light into the dark parts of our heart, the places that we're hiding from you, and help us to work on those things that are growing there that really shouldn't be there. Help us to be the people that you want us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. If I'm glad you're the one that's got the wasp and not us. <laughs> but actually, what he's talking about is we can let God shine his light into our hearts and reveal and take away the things that are our burdens in our hearts because we have victory in Jesus. And that's what we're going to sing, victory in Jesus. Let's stand. And this is like an old time almost a march kind of song so let's let's get with it yeah I
like us to sing that chorus one more time. Mark chapter 8, find our text for today. And again, since we are moving through Mark's gospel verse at a time, we have to remember the story as we go along. So remember where we've come from already, the, uh, the text that we looked at last week with the way the disciples were confused about who Jesus was and how he warned them about the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. That is where we were. This is where we come to. In verse 22 of that 8th chapter, Mark writes, They came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to him, and he begged and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hand on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his home, saying, Do not even go into the village. How close is close enough. What do you think? <laughs> That's an open-ended question. Every kid has probably heard the phrase, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. And maybe not kids, maybe you all as well. Uh, in, in my case, I heard that phrase often. Uh, it was usually after I came close to doing something that I was supposed to do completely. Something like cleaning my room or do close to doing my homework. Uh, the gist of it was that there are certain things uh, in life, like those proverbial horseshoes and hand grenades, that reward you for being close enough. But there are other things where close isn't enough. If you're trying to drive a nail into a board, then coming close with your hammer doesn't cut it. You actually have to hit the nail on the head. Life is full of things that we need to do, and it often comes down to this calculus, a matter of effort versus reward. Is the effort of getting close enough worth what you gain when you accomplish the task, whatever it is that you're trying to complete? I used to work with a painter uh, who, was a, who was a pretty good painter, but he recognized that he could spend an inordinate amount of time and effort trying to complete his job perfectly. He said that the first 95% of the job comes easy, but that last 5%, that's what will break you. For painting, a 95% job is close enough. And I guess that's probably true with a lot of different things. In a world where perfection is unattainable, 95% is about as close to perfect as you can expect. But 
when we're really starting to consider percentages, then I also suspect that a lot of us leave off a long time before 95%, maybe at 50, maybe at 30, maybe at 10%. You see, we don't realize the implication of not at least trying to get a little closer. Sometimes my homework was not even close to being done. My laundry wasn't even close to being picked up. See, my idea of, of close enough was clearly not enough. Structurally, as we look at Mark's gospel here, there's a lot going on in the text. Mark is moving us through this story. He's bringing us to the ultimate conclusion. And he's moving us right now towards a major, if not the major, shift in the narrative. So far, Jesus has been wandering around Galilee. Not really wandering. He knew where he was going. But he was in that region of Galilee, ministering to people there. And after this shift that Mark is, is beginning with here, he's going to start going somewhere else. He's going to be headed to Jerusalem and his ultimate destiny and his purpose. And right here in Mark's gospel, in chapter 8 and in chapter 9, Mark's getting us ready for that shift in direction. In this final section of Jesus' Galilean ministry, Jesus has been crossing all over the lake. He's going back and forth into different towns again and again. He's been encountering people, lots of people, both Jews and Gentiles. And these diverse groups and these individuals that he's been coming into contact with have all been responding to Jesus in a variety of ways. And that's something that Mark has been using, those different responses, as a way to show us, the reader, just who Jesus is. It's being revealed to us, shown to us. Even as the people in the story don't quite get it, we're starting to get a picture, hopefully. This miracle story that we just read, it's the closing of a, of a subsection, a part of Mark's Gospels. One of those Mark and sandwiches that I've told you about before that we've talked about. This sandwich began back in chapter 7. In chapter 7, there's a miracle there, the healing of a deaf man who has a speech impediment. And these two stories, these two miracles of healing, the deaf man here and then here the blind man, they have so many similarities, so many things that parallel that, that it's fairly clear that Mark wants to, to look at those as the bread and read that whole section, that whole unit together. And the theme of that section, the theme of that unit is this. Do you understand? The question that Jesus asks the disciples as they're in the boat on that ride to Bethsaida, that's the key to the passage. Jesus says, do you still, talking to the disciples, do you still not perceive and understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? That's what he's getting at. And it's not a coincidence that Jesus restores a deaf man at the beginning of the section and then a blind man here at the end. Seeing and hearing, it's important stuff. There are metaphors in this text for understanding. And so this whole section, this whole group of verses is all about understanding. Understanding who Jesus is and what Jesus wants. So according to the story that we read, the, once Jesus and his disciples, they land in that town of Bethsaida, down at the outflow of the Sea of Galilee, some people bring this blind man to him, and they beg Jesus to heal him. And so Jesus takes the man by the hand, and they leave the village, they step out to the outskirts, and like he does with that deaf man back in chapter 7, he puts saliva on his eyes, and he lays his hands on him. And he asks if the man can see. I can see people, the man says, but they kind of look like trees walking around. A second time, Jesus touches the man's eyes, and then finally, he can see clearly. Now there's, a, again, a similarity here between these two healings. Jesus touches the afflicted person twice. With the deaf man, he touches both the man's ears and his tongue, freeing both his ears from deafness and his mouth for speech. 
Here, the two touches are a little different. The, there's only one affliction. It's just blindness in this case. And Jesus touches that same affliction twice. Whereas in the first one, he touched two separate afflictions once. You don't need to make anything of that. It's just kind of something that's gotten people to ask some questions. There's quite a bit of commentary here about this twice-touched miracle. What's going on? It's kind of a strange story. You see, we were used to Jesus healing with lots of power and lots of authority, and here it's, it's odd. Did he not quite heal him the first time he touched him? As if somehow his power was slipping or he wasn't quite, maybe got up on the wrong side of the bed or wasn't paying attention or something like that? Did the, did the man's friends who brought him there, or maybe the man himself, maybe they didn't have enough faith? And what's the deal with the saliva again? Uh, what does that have to do with things? A lot of questions if you're looking at the details that arise. Is there a significance when the, the Scripture tells us that the man saw people, but he thought they were trees walking around? I don't know what that means. All this stuff is interesting, but I'm not sure it has much bearing on the interpreting this miracle. First of all, that we know, because we've already read this in this gospel and in all the gospel, we know Jesus is capable of any kind of healing. I mean, just anything. Both in, in what he heals people from and how he heals. Any kind of affliction, Jesus is, has power over that. Any infirmity from blindness to leprosy to demon possession, Jesus can deal with it. No problem. And the way that he does it is diverse and unique in every, every, every case. He does it with a touch. He does it with a word. He does it up close and personal. He does it at a distance. He doesn't even have to be in the same place. And it happens. Even a touch of the hem of his cloak is enough to heal. So this idea that Jesus wasn't able to heal on the first go around, eh, for some reason that doesn't strike me as accurate. It seems a little silly when you start to think about who Jesus is. And you know, I don't really think that this had much to do with the faith of those people in participating there, either the friends who brought the man or the man himself. See, that would imply that, that somehow miracles weren't really up to Jesus, so they were more up to us and what we did. It would, it would imply that the power of the ultimate fulfillment was something that rested in our hands, that we could do it. That's a transactional way of looking at this whole thing, as if Jesus were saying, well, well, you know, I, I tried, but your faith isn't strong enough. Maybe you need to come back with some better faith, and then we'll see what happens from there. I don't think that's what's going on here. If we come from a place of believing that Jesus is capable, which I hope that we are, uh, in any case of, of healing with no problem, then the problem in the, in the miracle, in the story, is, isn't with Jesus' power or his authority. And if we come from a place of, of understanding and believing that none of us personally have enough faith to, a, to elicit a miracle on our own, that we're dependent on a higher power, we're dependent on, on, on the grace and the compassion of Jesus, then the problem really doesn't reside with the other characters in the story either. And, you know, when you get right down to it, and you look at this story, the fact that Jesus touches the man two times may not be a problem at all. Maybe that's the point. So set aside all of those interesting, and they are interesting, believe me, details of the story. We set those aside. Uh, we, we, we need to be careful not to get caught up in details anyway. And let's think about this story as, as something that's situated in the bigger story that Mark is trying to tell us. Like I said, it's the closing point of a section that's focused on a particular theme that of understanding, having ears to hear and eyes to see. And if that's the case, then what does this miracle tell us about understanding? Once we extricate ourselves from the details, then this is what becomes clear. Jesus had been traveling around this region, journeying from one place to another. He's been healing. He's been teaching. And there's a lot of different people that encounter Jesus. We went through a partial list. There's a bunch. There's the Syrophoenician woman. There's the, the great crowds, the multitudes that come and are, and are fed. There's the deaf man. There's religious leaders, the Pharisees. And each one of these people and each one of these groups comes to Jesus and they each get something in return. 
But you know, there's another group that we don't really see in these interactions as prominently. But this group is present for pretty much all of that. It's the disciples. And so this section, really a big chunk of the, this part of Mark, all these miracles, all this teaching, it's not so much for each individual person or group that Jesus encounters as much as it is for this group that's witnessing all of this and participating in all of this. See, this, section on what it, this is a section on what it means to be a disciple. Now we're getting a little close to the bone here. It's not about them as much as it is about us. What we see from Mark's telling is this. The disciples, they've come a long ways. You think back to the first part of the gospel where Jesus initially called them and how far they've, they've come here. They've come a long ways, but they still have quite a ways to go. They're not really where they need to be yet. Go back to the story before this, and you can almost hear the exasperation in Jesus' voice. <laughs> Are you still not getting it? Are you still so hard-hearted? Are you still so senseless? That's what he's talking about, not having the ability to hear or see. You got ears, guys. You got eyes. Why don't you use them, for heaven's sakes? I may be putting a little bit of extra emotion in there, but I don't know. It kind of feels like that was where Jesus was. Come on, guys. Last week, we talked about that particular senselessness of the disciples, what they were exhibiting, how they were starting to become infected by that yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod, that corrupting influence of self-interest of seeing Jesus as a means to an end. But that's just one of the places where the disciples are falling down and falling short. It's a big one, to be sure, but certainly not the only one. Now, I want to be really clear about something here. When we look at the end of the story, the end of the Gospels, particularly in this case, the end of Matthew's Gospel, we see Jesus transferring the responsibility for the work that he'd begun to his disciples. It now becomes their work. His followers take this on. And in Matthew 28, and I'm sure you know where I'm going here, he gives us what is called the Great Commission. Okay? This is something that we should all be familiar with as followers of Jesus. He says to his disciples then and now, did you pinch her? They got it under control. Jesus says to his disciples, both then and now, he says, as you go about the world, as you go, make disciples. He says, baptize them and then teach them what I've taught you. I'm kind of condensing it a little bit there, but that's the gist of it. And so the key to being a follower of Jesus is to follow Jesus. I don't know if I can make it any more plain than that you want to be a follower of Jesus, then you kind of need to follow Jesus. That's what discipleship is. And the, and the core of Christian identity is discipleship. You see, we make a commitment to Jesus. We make a commitment to Jesus, publicly evident in our baptism, and then we learn everything that we can about Jesus in his way so that we can share that with other people, so that we can teach others. See, we can't teach them what we don't know. We can't teach them what we're not committed to ourselves. So there has to be this commitment of being a disciple, doing what we've learned, before we can really start into this process of making any disciples of anyone else. That's logical, really. It's simple. It's, dun, 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 dun. it's just like mathematics. This is where you end up. But I'll ask you, what has become of discipleship? Think about the church today, not necessarily this church, but maybe. Think about the church more generally. What has become of discipleship, this, this simple learning and living the way of Jesus? You see, if that is what is at the core of, of what it means to be a Christian, then where are all the Christians? Now, we don't need to talk about grace today. We don't need to talk about atonement here. Those are critical things. Those are important things. But that's what God does. That is God's gift to us. That is not something we have much to do with other than accepting it. What we do need to talk about is what we do. And we're not asked to do anything complicated or beyond our capacity. 
It's simply this. Commit. Commit to being a disciple. To publicly professing your faith. And then go about the work. Go about the work of understanding what Jesus has taught us and applying it in our lives. Using your ears, using your eyes, the things that God has given you to be the people that God wants you to be. You see, this miracle, and it is a miracle. I can't imagine what the guy who actually was healed, I mean, that's amazing for him. But this miracle is more than just that. This is a challenge to us as the followers of Jesus. Because when it comes to discipleship, we're like that blind man. When Jesus, what Jesus offers us is that touch, that healing touch. And if we choose, we can accept that touch and we can see. Oh, wow. But we don't always see clearly. Sometimes what we see is obscure and fuzzy. And we risk misinterpreting and misapplying and misrepresenting or worse what Jesus does for us the sight that he restores for us we treat it like an abstraction <laughs> that doesn't really apply in our everyday lives yeah yeah we'll we'll talk about it on Sunday but you know beyond that I got other stuff I got other stuff to deal with we know that we see people but they look like trees walking around more is needed more clarity, more vision, more understanding. We need that second touch. And Jesus is ready to give it. But how many of us actually live between the touches? Between that first and that second touch? We've accepted Jesus. Maybe we've been baptized, but we're content with close enough when it comes to discipleship. Imagine this. This blind man, what if he had said to Jesus, you know, yeah, I, I can see quite a bit better now, Jesus. That's, that's pretty cool. I, I wasn't anything before. Now I got something. I can see things happening, things moving around, figures. They kind of they look like trees walking around, but I'm guessing they're probably people. You want me to read things? No, I, that, that, I, that ain't going to happen. There's no way I'm going to be able to do that. Recognizing faces? No, probably not. It's pretty indistinct out there. Tell them the difference between a donkey and a goat and great Aunt Martha? Probably not going to happen. But hey, you know, it is, it is quite a bit better than it was. I'm liking it, so thanks, Jesus. I'll just be on my way now. Kind of silly, isn't it? Kind of ridiculous. But how many of us are there? How... What if this man had stopped after that first touch? What if he had been satisfied with, that's eh, close enough in his relationship with Jesus? See, when we think about being a disciple of Jesus, I don't think we should ever settle for close enough. If the question is, how close should I be to my Lord and my Savior, the one who gave his life for me, how close should I be? Then the answer is, well, closer than you are. Every time. We're never close enough. There's always more to learn. There's always more to understand. There's always more to apply, more clarity to gain, more to hear. You see, until we're in full union with Jesus in eternity, then close enough will never be enough. We'll always want more. And the point here, I'm not trying to dump a bunch of guilt or shame on you for where we are. This, where we are. I simply want to remind us that while we're not close enough, often because of a willful choice of ours, we choose to not be able to understand, there is no reason you need to stay there. You don't have to stay there. You can get closer and you can get clarity. Jesus is with us. Jesus has taken us by the hand and led us to where we, he can work on us. Jesus is there ready to touch us again and heal us further and grant us even more understanding. It's ready. We just have to. To want it. One of the persistent questions that gets kicked around my head is this. What does it mean to be the church? Capital C Church. The people of God. Who are we, as followers of Jesus, supposed to be in the world? How are we supposed to represent? 
That's a big question. I get it. There's a lot of stuff that gets put into that question. I'm constantly working out the implications, but the actual answer to that question is pretty simple. First, you've got to accept Jesus. Are you the church if you don't believe in Jesus? No. You might be something else. I don't know, some club or group or gang or whatever it is, but the church accepts Jesus. And when I say accept, I'm not talking about just believing that somebody named Jesus lived a long time ago and did, a, did some good stuff. Accepting Jesus in the meaningful way means that we accept who Jesus is, who the Gospels tell us that Jesus is, believing that what Jesus did for us is real and that it makes a difference. It's faith. Faith that believes that Jesus is not only telling the truth, but is the truth and the way and the life. But accepting Jesus in that meaningful way also means that what Jesus requires of us will have an impact on our lives. Oh, now, now we're getting to meddling. Gone from preaching to meddling now. Going to get into it. What Jesus wants from us should have an impact on us if we believe that Jesus is who Jesus is. That's discipleship. If Jesus is true and trustworthy, if we believe that, if Jesus is the Son of God, sent to save the world, as John the Evangelist tells us, then what Jesus wants really ought to be a priority, shouldn't it? Not the other stuff, as important as that seems to be. Actually, it should not be a priority. It should be the priority. Every aspect of our lives should be shaped by what Jesus wants. Every aspect, right? If you want to be the church, more than just people who go to church, then this is what that means. The church is the gathered people who believe Jesus and do what Jesus wants them to do in all things at all times. That's the ecclesia, the assembly devoted to Jesus, disciples together. But too often, the church is not that. You see, too often, we're more like a group of half-blind folks stumbling around trying to be half-committed and half-understanding, half-disciples. Instead of seeing what God wants in the world with clarity and insight, we second-guess everything. I don't know, maybe, uh, who can say? We second-guess every step because our vision is cloudy, clouded with the cares of the world and obscured by self-interest. And I'll tell you right now, it's that way not because we are incapable of seeing clearly any more than I was incapable of cleaning my room <laughs> or, or finishing my homework. It's because we're content with close enough. The Spirit is there, ready and able to clear things up for you, to give you that clarity of, of insight and, and a vision, to give us that more perfect sense of what God wants. But we choose obscurity. You see, being half-blind, being a half-blind, half-disciple means that we can keep half for ourselves. No, that's, that's that dark place underneath the house where something's growing, but I don't want anybody to know about it. We can keep part of that, of who we are, to ourselves. We don't have to surrender everything to Jesus. We don't have to give all so that we can gain our soul. We can keep stuff for ourselves. But what are we keeping? Blindness, obscurity, misunderstanding. We're keeping failure. Do you want to keep that? Do you want to hang on to that? I hope not. See, this miracle, and again, it's a miracle to the guy that experienced it. It's wonderful that he was able to regain his physical sight, but this miracle is also a parable. It's a tale that illustrates how foolish it is to remain in that halfway place. Discipleship is, in a lot of ways, getting rid of everything that needs to be gotten rid of, to stripping away of that old so that it can be replaced with the new. 
And that seems a little sacrificial, a little bit like, oh boy, do I want to give that stuff up? It may not always feel good when we do it. But what we're stripping away isn't really worth keeping to begin with. We're stripping away the lack of understanding. We're stripping away our senselessness and replacing it with new sight. As followers of Jesus, you've been given what you need. You've been given ears to hear and eyes to see. And through the discipline of discipleship, the learning and the living the way of Jesus, we can use those things that God has given us, use those gifts to understand a little better each day. And when we understand a little better, then we're going to be able to fulfill that commission that we've been given. We'll be able to be a little better equipped to share this wonderful gift of sight with others. See, we're, we can become the ones who, are, who see more clearly, which is exactly what we're meant to be, what God wants us to be as followers of Jesus together as the church. But we won't be. We won't be unless we refuse to settle for close enough. Good enough. I can kind of see. And it's better than it was. Can't make anything out. If we settle for half sight. And it's through that faithful following, that process, that discipleship, that we can ask for and we can accept that second touch again and again as we need it so that we can finally see clearly. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are grateful that you don't give up on us, and that you are present even now as your son was to this blind man in Bethsaida to touch us again to lay your hands on us again so that we can see more clearly than we ever have before. Lord, I pray that we would never be content. Give us a sense of discomfort and dis-ease with half sight, with half dedication, with half commitment. Help us to understand that that is not where you want us to be, that you want all of us, every little bit, so that we can be totally and completely yours. Pray these things in the name of your Son. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song. <clears throat> Learning to lean. Leaning on Jesus. again. Lord, we need your eyes to see this world as you see it. So we ask that you would grant us that. Help us to depend upon you, to lean on you this week, to trust you, that you will guide us and lead us where we need to go. We pray that you would give us the strength, that power beyond what we've dreamed, to impact the world for you, to love, to share your grace and 
compassion, to invite people into relationship with you. Give us every chance that we can possibly handle to do this. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may go in peace.